Hello and welcome to Clipping In. We're getting to that time of year where cycling YouTube is awash with videos full of helpful suggestions uh, preparing you for the Northern Hemisphere winter that's on its way. Feels a little bit odd making this video whilst uh, we're experiencing one of the mildest Octobers and early Novembers that I've known. Uh, but nevertheless, it will come. So I did a video on uh, winterizing your bike. That was a couple of weeks ago. And earlier this year, so last winter, I did one on keeping your feet comfortable. I think it was called warm winter feet. That was very well received. So I thought, uh, amongst all the other suggestions that are coming out there, I'd look for five observations or suggestions that if followed, at least some of them might make your cycling winter just a little bit more comfortable. So here we go with the first one. At some point, we're going to switch from bib shorts and knee warmers, leg warmers, to winter weight bib tights. And a lot of the modern bib tights that are around, they also include a pad. So you have a Roubaix thermal material, maybe with a DWR coating to give them a little bit more weather resistance, but they include the pad. A few years ago, I'd say that these were less common. These, you wear them once and then they've got to go in the wash. Uh, I think a few years ago, it was more common to have to wear your favourite bib shorts as normal, but then you'd go to something like these, which uh, originally had a coating, uh, and you can see that they've got a, a blue light thermal material, but also they had a double seat there. So no pad, but they had a double, double seat reinforcement. And then what you could do, if it was sufficiently cold, you could add, say, some thermal long johns between your favourite bib shorts and these bib tights. Or the other option was to go for something like these, which I think they were called husky fleece at the time. And they're a much thicker material. They've got more weather resistance there, a little bit of windproofing, a little bit of water repellency when they're new. Uh, and they're backed with this white polyester fleece. Uh, again, much thicker material. Now, all well and good. You, you don't need me to tell you about that. But the point here that I'm getting to is that when you start layering up like that you're putting not only uh, you're putting more material underneath your bib shorts between your bib shorts and your saddle and what you're actually doing uh, you're lifting yourself further off the saddle and some people you know if it might be two it might be three millimeters but some people won't feel that i mean personally i can switch between say riding a mountain bike one day where i do run a lower saddle by about six mil uh, and i can go to a road bike the next day and that's, you know, I don't have any problem switching between them. But other people who like to have their bike fit sort of, you know, dialed in, laser guided, uh, they, won't, they won't make that adjustment as easily. And they might find themselves self-adjusting by sliding forward on the saddle. So one thing that we used to do in the old days when we used to layer up a lot more, materials weren't as weatherproof, they didn't have a sort of a, a degree of windproofing either. So we were wearing more layers and therefore what we would do on our dedicated winter bikes, we would drop the saddle height to, a, to, you know, to, to, to compensate for that extra three mil of material that you were sitting on. Um, and I think that's something, if you find, once you start layering up, if you find that you're not as comfortable or something seems to have changed in your bike fit or your pedaling leg length, have a look at your saddle height. It might just need a little tweak, dropping it by a couple of mil, and then you can push it back up in the spring when you're back in your bib shorts again. Now, the next point is, is in a similar direction, really. If you are wearing, say, a base layer, some kind of Mariclon polypropylene, then you've got your bib shorts with the braces, then you might have a lightweight jersey, then you might have thermal overtights, and then you might have a midweight jersey, and then some kind of cycling jacket, which are really a heavyweight jersey, really, I suppose. All that extra stuff is pulling on your shoulders on your upper back and what you might find if your standard position is quite aerodynamic then as you assume that aerodynamic position that extra tension that's pulling on your shoulders and upper back may on longer winter rides give you a stiff neck or a sore back and it's something that again what we used to do is we'd lift our handlebar height by a few mil to compensate for all those extra layers and all that tension 
that's uh, that's pulling down on your shoulders and stopping you getting as flat as you might otherwise be. Uh, so again, something to consider if on the long rides, mysterious shoulder, neck and back pains are settling in. Have a look at your bar height. It used to be dead easy on the older bikes with quill stems because all you needed was a six mil Allen key. Slacken it off, lift it, tighten it up again. And similarly, you could reverse it very easily. So if you had a winter where you were varying between uh, southwest Atlantic weather systems that were mild or Arctic weather systems that were cold, you could change your stem height almost you know, daily if you wanted to. It's not as easy now with, with airhead systems because you have obviously you've got to uh, slacken the stem off, you've got to take the top, you're losing the headset, you've got to move the spacers, but it's still doable and it's something that's worth thinking about and worth having a look at if mysterious aches and pains are appearing on your winter bike. The alternative, if you've got a dedicated winter bike, is that you just automatically run a higher bar height on that with an endurance type geometry than you would on your summer bike. Let's get on to the third point. Now this predates my time as a cyclist. It goes right back to my mountaineering days. And it was a, a bit of advice given to me by a friend and climbing partner uh, who also happened to be a surgeon. So it involves the use of uh, latex style surgical gloves. What do you want those for? Well, now then, in the mountaineering world, when you're doing what we would call you know, non-technical stuff, snow plods, you can quite happily get away with those big uh, boxing glove type uh, gauntlets that were in the thumbnail. If we pick those out there, they've got a, a Gore-Tex shell, they've got a, a sticky palm area. You can, you can cinch them down with straps here. And the inside is a, what you might call an artificial, artificial sheepskin. And they also, they've got a little bit of closed cell foam in the knuckle area. Uh, to protect your hands when you're climbing steep ice. But in these types of gloves, you're not likely to be doing that. The reason why is because you don't have any dexterity. And if you're doing technical climbing, you need to be able to uh, belay, you need to be able to pay the rope out, you need to be able to tie knots, place gear, clip the rope in and out, all that kind of stuff. And you need a degree of dexterity, and therefore you need gloves rather than mittens. And I think cycling has something in common with that because if you use these type of you know boxing glove mittens, you can't change gear properly, you can't really control your braking, you can't do a lot on a bike, you know, apart from say riding on the tops or on some flat bars if you're on single speed maybe. So the tip given to me by my friend was simply that if uh, you were doing the intermittent work of technical climbing, he used to, m just matter of course, wear some latex surgical gloves underneath um, a pair of um, rubber sticky palmed uh, acrylic gloves. And that gave him a combination of insulation and windproofing and so on. And he found that very, very effective. Now, I'm not suggesting that you wear surgical latex gloves right from the start. I think for a cyclist, they're very, very useful as a booster. And by that, I mean, often, you know, with a British winter, we can set off and for three hours, our clothing's perfectly adequate and we're comfortable. But then if we get caught in a cloudburst and we get wet, then all the insulation properties uh, change you know it's a complete game changer and gloves that you maybe set off being comfortable with now they're wet through they lose their insulation properties the wind chill factor then is you know insupportable and your hands go numb and therefore having some latex gloves as a booster for those kinds of situations they pack down to nothing you can put them in your seat pack or whatever um and they can just you know it's a get you out of jail option isn't it i also think uh, doubling up that if you have some kind of messy roadside mechanical you can put your latex gloves on sort that mechanical out take the gloves off and your hands are still nice and clean and that's ideal if you go to the more fashionable uh, coffee and tea emporia out on the roadside now this point might be um, more of interest to uh, older riders. Uh, certainly I I'm bringing it in because my dad in his mid 70s became more prone to getting a chill, what you'd say below the belt line, um, lower abdomen, you know, if he got a chill on that and then he'd have an upset tummy for quite a long time. And it came about when if he was uh, climbing, he, he had windstopper type material 
on his jersey so he was comfortable there, but he might get a little bit damp sweat-wise. And then you switch from climbing at maybe six, seven miles an hour to a very, very fast freewheeling at 35, 40 miles an hour where the wind chill is phenomenal. And then he would get chilled and he would get chilled below the belt line where the jersey ended. And you can get windstopper fronted uh, bib tights and that kind of thing. But what we actually did uh, was use a bar bag. Uh, and when I say bar bag, I'm particularly meaning something like a French sacoche, which are a semi stiffened bar bag. And if I can show you here, they fix with what is called a click fix system that fits around the handlebar stem area. And then the bag itself is semi stiffened. This is a seven litre sacoche. And if you think about where this is going to fit on the front of the handlebars, it sits off the handlebars themselves, so you can still access the handlebar tops as normal. You've got full access to the levers and the STI controls. But what this does, it uh, shields the lower abdomen. It shields the below the belt area and protects you from at least some of that wind chill effect when you're screaming down hills at high speeds. Yes, obviously there's, a, there's an aerodynamic penalty to be paid for it because it's blocking wind, but it's remarkably effective at doing that. And it's, it's almost like having an extra layer of insulation uh, that, that isn't causing you to overheat when you're climbing because it's a wind blocker rather than insulation. So I think 20-odd uh, years ago, people, I would say they, they were um, more surprised when they saw bar bags on, on ordinary day rides. But now, bar bags seem to be everywhere. And now I know a lot of them are the smaller uh, bar roll type of bags that, that fix directly to the handlebar tops, rather than the, the sacoche with the click fix that sit off the bars. But I still think if, if you don't particularly mind how it looks on your bike, and I, I, I don't think most people will at winter, it can serve a very, very useful purpose. And, you know, you can always take your seat pack off, put all your spares and tools and food and so on from your jersey pockets in here. And it's, you know, it's useful for carrying all those extras that you need at winter. Now I'm mindful of running time, so I'll, I'll get on to number five, the final point for this video. This might be the controversial one. Are you ready? A helmet cover. I could hear the collective gasp from all the fashionistas out there. A helmet cover, yes. What this is, is a, a Gore-Tex helmet cover that fits easily. You can fit it, remove it in seconds. What's the advantage of that? Well, there are, I think there are many advantages of it, really. What we've said is that many of the approaches that we're that we're using when you wear a cycle helmet and I assume from what I see out on the roads that most riders nowadays are wearing a helmet I didn't start wearing a helmet at winter until about 2005 prior to that I preferred using a, a woolly hat uh, and I found that a woolly hat was better suited to uh, variable intensities you might be climbing working hard with a woolly hat you could just progressively lift it off your head so it was just perched on top of your head, or you could even take it off, push it inside your jersey. Then, when you got to the top of the hill and you're ready to start descending, you could pull it down, right down, cover your ears, and you had, you know, insulation like that. You can't do that anything like as simply or as easily when you're wearing a helmet. The most you can do is maybe vent your ears a little bit, but the rest of the hat, it's trapped under the helmet, strapped on. And what, what you're really doing when you're wearing under helmet uh, insulation, you're taking a guess at what the extremes of the day will be in terms of temperature, wind chill and intensity. And you're hoping that that particular hat will cope with the range of extremes. Now, with uh, helmets that are using the MIPS system, which is like an internal slip liner designed to reduce rotational brain trauma, whether it works or not is another issue, but a MIPS liner, I've generally found that it makes the helmets much, uh, much more snug, and therefore it gives you fewer options at slipping heavy duty insulating hats beneath the helmet. I know my MIPS helmet, I can get a bandana under there, I can get an ordinary cycling cap, but that's about it. I couldn't put uh, multi-layer thermal hats or balaclavas or anything like that. I mean, when it's normally what I would do if it's very cold, this uh, Discovery 
uh, winter cap. It's a sort of a lightweight synthetic version of a typical Belgian winter cap. It's got ear covers, it's got a peak, which, you know, as a glasses wearer, I really appreciate having a peak because it keeps uh, rain and, and sleet off my glasses for as long as possible. Uh, so what I would do if I needed something warmer than this, then I've been using these quite recently, which uh, use BioRacer Tempest material, which is partially windproof, uh, and it's nicely insulated. It's a little bit water repellent coating. It's got a, a fairly generous peak and it's got some merino wool ear flaps that you can lift up or drop down to cope with uh, you know, changes in temperature. But I still think that with the British winter, really our, our primary enemies are precipitation and wind chill. And with the MIPS type helmet, I couldn't accommodate that uh, thicker Belgian winter cap under a MIPS helmet. I couldn't do it. With my, um, with my Giro Syntax 2, it's a non-MIPS, I've got much more scope there for putting thicker hats underneath. But with the MIPS, I can't do that. So I think this is where, I'm getting to the point, this is where the helmet cover comes in. Because what you're actually doing you, you're cutting out all the uh, cooling air that comes through those helmet vents, which is very, very welcome at summer. But at winter, this stream of cold air that's coming through the vents and over the top of your head, uh, a lot of the time that makes the windshield you know, feel far worse. With a helmet cover, you're cutting that out. I think it's better to use something like this, which is, it's Gore-Tex, it's waterproof, windproof, rather than go for um, a Blue Peter option with sticky back plastic or helicopter tape, because helmets are using, most of the time, a shell over expanded polystyrene, and they, more often than not, they can be compromised, supposedly, by the use of adhesives. I know that they're certainly compromised by ultraviolet light. That's the case with climbing helmets, too. Uh, with climbing helmets, once they're exposed to strong ultraviolet in the mountains, the timer has started, the clock's ticking, and you, you supposedly got to replace them in a certain time period. Bike helmets are no different, and they say that different adhesives, you shouldn't put stickers on expanded polystyrene bike helmets. So for that reason, I think that, that using something as simple as a helmet cover is, uh, is the best option, because you therefore, you're not forcing thick balaclavas or skull caps underneath the helmet. You are blocking the wind, and you will probably find that a you know a thin balaclava or a cotton cycling cap or a bandana is more than enough once you've blocked the wind. These are remarkably effective. I know that they do get the odd uh, glance or two. They're not they're not common. You certainly won't see them in the moody black and white fashion conscious uh, brands of cycling apparel. We know that, but. What I would do, I'd counter that by saying, this is my this is my spin on it, that I think when you wear these, you look a little bit like a professional Japanese Kirin rider. Now they are exceptionally hard as nails and they're also very, very cool. Uh, so remember that if anybody does give you an odd glance in a helmet cover. If they're good enough for Japanese Kirin riders, they're good enough for most of us. Look, I don't want this to turn into a into a sort of an extended Ronnie Corbett joke. <laughs> I need a bigger chair for that anyway. So what I'll do at this point now, I'll draw a line. The comments section as always is open and I'm sure that there will be other points relating to winter equipment, winter clothing that will crop up when winter finally arrives. And those, I'll just drop them into future clipping in videos. But for now, I'm going to sign off and I will say bye for now and see you very soon back out on the autumn winter Yorkshire roads for another edition of Clipping In. Bye bye.